Good morning. Good morning. It's an honor to be here again. Again, I just want to echo what I said last time. I'm so, um, I'm just so encouraged that your church is dedicating multiple weeks and services to the topic of mental health. And today we're going to talk about crisis and trauma. But before we start, I just, I want to open with a word of prayer. Lord God, we're just so grateful. We know that you are already here with us. And we're going to talk about crisis and trauma today. And, and that's a heavy topic. And so we're grateful that you are here with us, that you offer, God, your love, your comfort, and your compassion. And so I just pray that every word that comes out of my mouth would be from you and that you would use this time God, to just minister to people. So we thank you, God. We love you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to start with a scripture. Isaiah 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, teachings the islands will put their hope. Isaiah's prophecy looks forward to Jesus, our Savior, and to the one who will not break a bruised reed. And this is not because Jesus is weak. It's not because Jesus is a pushover. We know that he is strong and he's powerful, but he knows how to apply strength perfectly to vulnerability. Think about a smoldering wick, right? There's barely a flame left in it. And the tiniest disturbance or the tiniest, the slightest breeze would snuff it out. Yet Jesus is able to offer his care, his love in such a gentle and intentional way that even the most delicate, fragile, wounded of things are taken care of, nurtured and protected. And so Jesus exemplifies both perfect gentleness and infinite strength. And this offers such hope to a person who's experienced trauma. And he will bring justice, right? He will make things right in the new heaven and in the new earth. There will be no trauma. So crisis and trauma, these are are terms that we we kind of throw them around and I want to give some definition to them. Um, When we talk about crisis, we're talking about a situation that a person perceives to both have a significant impact on their life And it feels really overwhelming. And this combination of feeling that there's a significant impact and at the same time feeling overwhelmed makes it hard for a person in that moment with that situation to use some of the coping strategies that maybe they would normally use in other situations. Examples of crisis, failing out of school, losing a job, a new medical diagnosis. And we talk about the prevalence, right? When we talk about mental illness or emotional struggles. Last time I said with depression, one in five people will experience depression at some point in their life. Well, 100% of you are going to experience crisis. We live in a broken world. In James, it says, when you face trials of many kinds, right? It doesn't say if, And so we know we are all going to face hard things that are going to be really stressful and they're going to test like our coping. Now, when we talk about trauma, it's a little bit different. Trauma refers to an intense and overwhelming experience. It can be direct. That means it can happen to you or indirect where you witness it. It involves serious loss, threat of harm or threat or harm to a person's physical or emotional well-being. Now with trauma, we're talking about an experience that's actually so overwhelming in the moment that a person's brain and their emotions literally can't process it. 
It's that overwhelming. And so examples of trauma, sudden death of a loved one, catastrophic loss from a natural disaster, war, combat, domestic violence, a serious car accident, assault, childhood abuse and neglect. And what's interesting is trauma is also very, very common. There's research that suggests about 80 to 90% of people will experience a traumatic event at some point in their life. So these are things when we talk about crisis and we talk about trauma, these are things that impact all of us. The impact, just as when I talked about depression, talked about the holistic way that depression can impact a person, the impact of trauma is holistic. It impacts a person physically, emotionally, mentally, relationally, and spiritually. And I wanna talk a little bit about what happens to a person's body when they experience trauma, and we're gonna go a little bit into the, the brain science. It's important to understand that to understand trauma. Now, as Pastor Rick said last week when he talked about anxiety, a fear response is actually a really good thing, right? It helps us to survive and it helps us to stay safe in a situation that actually is dangerous. And when a person experiences trauma, they are not safe. Right? They are in a dangerous situation and their, their brain actually registers it as danger. And this causes a chemical response right, where our body releases cortisol and adrenaline and neurohormones. And the person enters into what's called fight, flight, or freeze. And if a person in that moment of experiencing a trauma in that state of fight, flight, or freeze, if we could actually like put you in an MRI machine and scan your brain, which we can't, but if we could, we would see that the amygdala, so this is an important part of the brain when we talk about trauma, the amygdala, we're gonna refer to it as the alarm center. Imagine um, a fire alarm going off in your brain, right? And if a fire alarm goes off, it's danger. You need to exit the building, there's something dangerous. That part of the brain though, if we could scan your brain, it would be lit up, we could see it. So an example, so I live in Hartford. My husband and I, um, we had felt called specifically to live in Hartford and to live in this very specific house in this very specific neighborhood and we've lived there for the last 12 years and it's been a blessing. We have wonderful neighbors, we love our community, we love our church and there are dynamics that are common to urban communities, right, that we experience. There's community violence, there's drugs and a few years back, when I was pregnant with my second child, a person was shot right outside of my house. And I remember hearing the gunshot. And if you live in an urban community, you learn to discern, is that close or is that far? And this was one that was close. And so I heard it and I went to the, the window and I saw a car come to a screeching halt. And the person, the people in the car actually threw out a man into the street and the man was shot. And of course, everyone, right, we all call the police, we call an ambulance, you know, and this is something that affects a whole community. But there was this five to 10 minutes, and it felt like an eternity, waiting for the ambulance, the police to come, and we're watching this man suffer, right? And that's where you see how trauma, one traumatic event can, can impact a whole community. You know, and as a believer, I remember feeling torn. You know, should I go out and help? Should I go pray for this person? But I was pregnant, so I didn't. I didn't want to bring my child into that. Anyway, the police did come. The man was brought to the hospital. He lived, and kind of life went on. But one of the things that was interesting is I didn't feel right the next day. And I recognized I felt irritable. I felt tired. I, I couldn't think clearly. If I thought about what had happened the night before, it was upsetting. And it was interesting, that event didn't actually register to me as a trauma at first. It was just a thing that had happened. Um, but it, it was interesting over the course of the next week in talking to my neighbors, everybody felt that way. And that's because that was a trauma and in the moment we couldn't all process it. So that was our body. There's um, a term acute stress disorder or acute stress. And it's very common after someone experiences a trauma to just not quite feel right. 
And that's why we have to be very sensitive. One event can impact many people if they witness it. And we have to be so careful with social media and the news, particularly with children. But anyway, it's very common for people to experience that acute stress and to not quite feel right after, um, after a traumatic event. But for most people, after a period of time, their body is able to process it and they can work through it and they start to feel normal again. However, for some people, they don't. And that they develop what's called PTSD. I'm sure you've all heard that term before. And when a person has PTSD, their amygdala. So remember, that's the alarm system, the alarm in their brain going off that's saying danger. Their amygdala, their brain is registering danger even though the person is not any longer in danger. Or sometimes that alarm system gets stuck on. And it's a good thing. It's a God-designed thing. When our alarm system is going off when we're in danger, it's not so good, though, when it's going off while a person's trying to take a test or work or parent their children. And so a trigger is another important term when we talk about PTSD. Triggers are cues in the environment that remind a person of the trauma. It can be a sound, it can be visual, a sensation, a smell, a place, anything that in any way reminds the person of the trauma and causes their brain to register a situation as unsafe. Now, symptoms of PTSD include re-experiencing, re-experiencing the event in some way, avoidance, trying to avoid anything that reminds a person of the trauma, emotional dysregulation, just having emotions that are kind of up and down, and hyperarousal. This is kind of this uneasy feeling, waiting for the next bad thing to happen. And often when someone is experiencing PTSD, they really do benefit from counseling. And there are certain approaches that are particularly helpful. One is called EMDR. And it helps the brain to process what has happened. Um, in, the ta in the table, in the hallway, um, there's actually two handouts today. There's one, and it has some more information about PTSD and trauma. And there's actually a green handout that I brought this morning. And there's so much that can be said about trauma, and all of it can't be said in 30 minutes. So I brought that handout because it has some very practical things that a person can do to help each part of their brain that's impacted by trauma. So I would encourage you to take a look at those. Now I lead children's ministry at my church. A little bit about me. I have taught classes continually for the last 10 years. And anyone who knows me knows that I love children. I love teaching classes. I love when kids from the neighborhood are playing um, in my yard. And I generally think of myself as pretty patient. But there was one day when I was teaching the kindergarten and first grade class. Now, this goes back a little while. Um, and there was one Sunday where some, a new child came into the class. And as a teacher, you're excited, right, when someone new comes. And you really want to love them and you want them to know Jesus. So I was determined, I'm going to make this child feel welcome. And so I handed him a coloring page and I handed him the crayons. And he looked at me and he picked up his crayons and he snapped them in half one by one. But I thought, that's okay. You can color with broken crayons. It's okay. So he looks at me and he takes his paper and he tears it to little pieces. And I say, that's okay, you can, you can sit and listen. And this persisted, right, throughout the class. And finally, um, part of our process, our, the way our church works is we bring the kids to the bathroom as a class. And so I bring the class to the bathroom and I'm still patient. However, this child took off and he is running in and out of the men's and women's room and I'm chasing him and I finally get this child cornered. Now this was not my best moment as a Sunday school teacher. But I get this child cornered and I say, you have to be safe, like this is not safe. You need to listen to me or I'm gonna have to go get your parents. And this child looks at me and his demeanor changes. He says, you can't get my parents. My dad hurt my mom and he's in jail and she's in the hospital. Right, and there's this moment, your heart aches. So I took him and of course, 
you know, I take them back to the class, I sit them on my lap, I talk, but what was interesting, the whole class heard this, right? And this is, remember, kindergarten and first grade, we're talking about five and six-year-olds, and they heard what he said. And so we're sitting back in the room and another child says, it's okay, my dad's in jail too. And someone else says, well, my cousin was shot. And someone else says, yeah, my mom's really sick. And the whole class starts sharing. And it's just this reminder, trauma impacts children. Trauma and crisis are not just things that impact adults. Children are just as impacted. And now we have to remember that all trauma is not the same. So kind of four things to consider when you think about any any traumatic event. Was it direct or indirect? Right? Did it affect you or did directly or did you witness it? Was it a single event, just occurred one time, or was it repeated and chronic? Did it occur in childhood or did it occur in adulthood? And was it relational? Was it something, in particular, when we think about relational, a person who you thought you could trust or you should have been able to trust, did they do something to you? Or was it situational, like a hurricane or a fire or a tornado? And we know that trauma that is direct, repeated, occurs in childhood and in the important context of important relationships is particularly, it's impactful in a deeper way. And there's this term, what's called developmental trauma. And this is trauma that, again, it occurs in childhood, it tends to be repeated, tends to occur in the context of relationships that, you know, by God's design, a person, a child um, should be able to trust. They should care for that child. Now, there's ACEs research. Maybe many of you have heard about ACEs research, adverse childhood experiences. And this is somewhat recent, um, but it is one of the largest scale research studies looking at trauma. And it's, you know, national data. And they've looked at 10 different types of what they call adverse childhood experiences or trauma. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, divorce, incarceration, parent with a mental health, parent struggling with addiction and domestic violence. And this research, what we found is 67% of people experienced at least one of those ACEs. So that's where we said it's 80 to 90% experienced trauma just in general. But this is that early childhood trauma. It's very, very common. And what we now know from this research, because they followed people um, across their lifespan, is that it continues to impact them well into adulthood. There's a higher prevalence of struggling emotionally with mental health, physical health, even an earlier death. And so we know from this research, childhood trauma has such a significant impact on us. It's not just something that we're going to get over because time passes. It's something that needs attention, and it's something that we need to heal from. Now, it's God's design that infants are born helpless, right? Infants are born in a state where they need adults to take care of them, and children need care for many, many years. And God um, gives children, we, children have God-given needs for safety, for love and belonging, positive identity, teaching and discipline, and the degree to which these needs are met are going to impact a person over the long term. And some of you might even be listening right now and be aware of, of those types of needs that weren't met and the ways that maybe it's still impacting you. And we have abuse. Sometimes there's bad things that happen that hurt a child. But what we often don't talk about is neglect. Sometimes there's positive things that God wanted a person to have, but they didn't receive. And both are deeply impactful. Um, before I worked at Urban Alliance and before I was in private practice, I was at the Yukon Health Center. And for years, I actually worked exclusively with women and teens who had PTSD. And I was a counselor. And one of the things that really struck me was at the onset when they, so these are people, they had trauma and they had PTSD. Everyone who has a traumatic event doesn't have PTSD. Um, 
for so many of the women, when I would work with them, if I were to ask them at the onset, like before we really started working, did you experience childhood trauma? So many of them would say, no, no, I didn't experience trauma. They were very aware of the places in the present as adults where they were struggling, right? Maybe it was mental health, maybe they had been incarcerated, maybe it was addiction, relationships, whatever that looked like, but they had no sense of the ways that the traumatic experiences from early in life were continuing to impact them. And they wouldn't have even labeled it as trauma. And so for them, the process of telling their story, giving voice to painful experiences, labeling them as trauma, it was freeing, empowering, and healing. And so for many people, a first step in trauma recovery is simply acknowledging what happened and how it impacted them. Now we know that healthy relationships are healing and the human brain is shaped and molded by interactions. You think about why are you the person you are today? And of course there's a genetic component, but so much of that is the way that you or your brain was shaped and molded by experiences interacting with other people. And fortunately, the brain has a biologically innate capacity to grow new neurons, to form new connections. This is called plasticity. And the good news is God, he can supernaturally heal anything, right? So even without plasticity, he could heal our brains. But isn't it so encouraging that by his design, we are naturally able to heal in the context of loving relationships. Right? And there's all kinds of relationships that we can engage in. It could be with a counselor or a friend or a family member or in a prayer ministry. But relationships are healing. And in Matthew 6, Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. And he's not just teaching them what words to use. He's teaching them about their relationship with God. And I love that he teaches them to address God as our Father. Right? We are God's children and he is our parent. Romans 8, 14 through 17. For as many are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children, then heirs. Right? God made us part of his family. He put us in relationship. Right? We are brothers and sisters, and we all have the same heavenly father. Right? And this relationship is wonderful. But honestly, we have to be honest, sometimes it's confusing or frightening for people who've experienced childhood trauma. In fact, our early impressions of God are based often on our interactions with our parents so if your parents were disapproving, you might imagine a God who's disapproving and angry. And if you had a parent who are emotionally absent, you might imagine God as distanced. And if you were abused, an omnipotent, all-powerful heavenly father might be a terrifying thing. And when trauma occurs in the context of the relationship that God intended, right, to meet some of these needs, we talked with depression about how we have views of ourselves, others, and the world common themes with trauma, shame, to feel there's something wrong with me. When we think about relationships, to feel intimacy is scary. People will hurt me if I let them get too close. And of the world, the world is dangerous and I'm out of control and helpless. But again, healing happens in relationship and what better place to start this process that, than in relationship with our loving heavenly father who will never harm us or let us down. And in fact, God is the perfect parent and he meets all of our attachment needs. And I could go on and on about all of the ways that God is a wonderful father. So I'm gonna call out a few. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list, but God delights in his children, right? Like he enjoys you. It gives him pleasure when you talk to him, when you spend time with him, when you love him. And many people who have trauma, as I said, struggle with a deep sense of shame feeling that there's something wrong with them. And one of the antidotes to shame is being with a person who sees you, so like not what you do, but you, and enjoys you. And God does that for us. Zephaniah 317, 
The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves you. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you. He will rejoice over you with singing. He sings over you. God is sovereign, right? He is a father who is sovereign and he's good. And he's always working for your good. He always loves. It's his nature to love. He is a perfect, he loves perfectly. And so he is always loving us and he's always teaching. He doesn't let us stay where we are the same. He's wanting us to grow and to become more like him. And so God is the perfect parent. And there's a way that as we interact with him, we said interactions shape our brain. We interact with our heavenly father and we have new experiences. And then that changes and heals how we understand him, ourselves, other people, and the world. My final thought is that Jesus experienced crisis and trauma. And of course, there was rejection, betrayal. Many believe his father Joseph died before his ministry. And so we say, how did Jesus cope? Well, we see over and over again in scripture, Jesus left the crowds to be with his father. And then there was the crucifixion, right? And crucifixion was a horrible way to die. It involved intense suffering, right? Physical and for Jesus, spiritual. And it was trauma. And Jesus knew it was going to happen. And he wasn't unaffected. It caused distress. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he says to his disciples, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And the next thing he did, it says, and he went a little beyond them. He fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you do. Jesus modeled for us when he was facing trauma, Jesus cried out to his father, right? He surrendered his will to his father. And so Jesus, he experienced trauma. And so he has compassion for us in suffering, right? Because crisis and trauma, they involve suffering. And compassion means that he's deeply concerned. He cares, but he offers more than just compassion. He has empathy because he experienced it, because he felt that pain. He understands our experience when we have crisis and trauma. So in conclusion, we can engage then with each part of the Trinity in pain. Now pain is broader, but in, for today in crisis and trauma. So we have Jesus who has compassion and he has empathy and he's near and he wants to help. But also I love Hebrews 8.34. Jesus, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of the God, right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So right now, Jesus is standing at the right hand of his father and he's praying for you. That gives such a comfort and such a hope when we're struggling. And as Jesus modeled, right, we cry out to our father because he is the source of all help and healing. So we pray in trauma for each part of us that's impacted. We pray for ourselves physically, for our thoughts and beliefs, for our emotions, places where we were wounded, for any place where there was a spiritual impact. And since we know that relationships heal, we ask our Heavenly Father, I love the expression, to taste and see. So sometimes we know in our mind something that's true about God, but we don't always feel it, or we don't deeply, deeply know it. And that's true if someone experiences shame after trauma. They might know God loves them, I'm a new creation, but they might still feel that shame. And so we say, God, help me to taste and see, to have new experience with, experience with, experiences with you that are healing so that my head knowledge becomes heart knowledge and we're transformed. And we also ask that he would bring us into just the right relationship because he gives us each other. And as I said before, he wants us to be interdependent and to help one another. And he knows the relationships that each person needs to heal. And finally, there are also moments in crisis or trauma where it just feels like the pain is too much. 
And a person might feel overwhelmed and just feel like, I just, I'm stuck. I don't even know how to pray or what to ask for. And the Holy Spirit comes and helps you. Romans 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. So if you have a moment of weakness and you don't know what to do, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So if you're weak and you don't know what to pray, that's okay too, because the Holy Spirit will come and will be in you and help you to, to pray and intercede for you. And so we cry out to our Father. We know that Jesus is near and has empathy and compassion. And we trust that the Holy Spirit is helping us in weakness.